Welcome to Missing in Canada, an ongoing series by the Nighttime Podcast. Madeleine Klein, it's a pleasure. Hello. It's a pleasure to have you here tonight. And I, I just finished laughing at your latest video. You you're, you published a video to your TikTok in which uh, you talked about how does it take me an hour to make a 10 minute video? And then you posted some outtakes with your adorable cl cats climbing all over you as you tried to record. That well, was heartwarming. It's funny you bring that up because look, you can see his shadow right now, oh actually. God, little He's... <laughs> You, he's come here do your cats just follow you around the house all day pretty much oh, they man. just yeah they just hang out and sometimes they get a little for like an hour a day they get like squirrely but okay. otherwise they just yeah they just sleep uh, and fight nothing. each other and just, hang out yeah. just a bit of cat talk here is uh my my brother has a himalayan siamese and he Ooh. often talked about um he called it the elevensies, and he said every night around eleven for an hour, my cat's crazy. Does, does your cats? Do your cats have the elevensies? Uh, it's more like the sixies, oh. right after supper. Okay. They uh, they start, especially the, the we have a big black cat, mm -hmm. and he just like darts around the house, and he's so big, he's like a bull in a china shop. <laughs> and, oh, and yeah. Then you, then you got the big long, uh, sleek leopardy, tigery looking thing. Yeah, there he is. Oh, good. I think he's going to settle right away oh, here. Well, let's not disturb so. him. Uh, how have you been? What's new? What's going on? Uh, I've been good. Nothing nothing too new and exciting. It's been beautiful here. It's like spring here. I've driven home with my window town three days in a row. What? I know. I'm not sure if a, if a climate's supposed to fluctuate like this, but you know what? I'll take it. Yeah, well, that's... I, so. I don't know if it's much different on the West Coast, but on the East Coast, they're always like, if you don't like the weather, just wait 15 minutes. That's and exactly what they say over here. <laughs> that's the same thing. I think everyone says that. They're like, where I live has the craziest weather. And I think just everyone like everyone likes... says where they live has the worst drivers. Or the best pizza. Uh, oh my God, you're right. Because <laughs> where I'm, my hometown actually has the best pizza in Canada, Cape Breton. Or... It, like... Is this like officially on a list? Yeah, a list that I made of the best pizza. <laughs> number one is that like my preferred hometown pizza. Number two is the other hometown pizza that I get. It's uniquely awesome uh, in Cape Breton. Um, okay. But are, are you saying that Regina has good pizza? Well, it's yeah, it's like kind of a thing over here because I guess we it's have... a thing everywhere. I don't even want to hear it. It's a thing everywhere. Everyone says they have the best pizza in their town. I guess we're the only ones with Greek owned restaurants and they we have like this special Greek pizza. I don't know. The special like the special Greek Italian pizza. I guess. It, but it's it's not like that's not like the flavor. It's just like the I don't know the way they make it. I had no yeah. idea because I grew up with it. It's but it's the almost... best pizza I've ever had. I had this summer in New Brunswick. Oh, really? OK. Re yeah. um, pizza and the where the best pizza is almost like this religious thing it's like it gets passed down from it's like i was raised to know that the type of pizza that my family prefers is the one in my hometown so I it is just right. like it's like a part of me and uh and it's it, almost like this unshakable faith i have in my hometown pizza shop and i think that's why pizza stores they do so good and they last forever like it seems you know restaurants come and go but pizza shops seem to be forever that's true now that you say that we're Maybe. all really living the same lives in, in different houses. <laughs> and thinking it's special where we live. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I don't know if uh, if anything, I don't think much has been up with me, uh, much interesting. I finished watching, I told you I was watching the Netflix special, The Watcher, uh, which was 
pretty interesting. The first three episodes, it's like, a, I don't know, six or seven part series. The first three episodes were amazing. But then when it got to the point that they were kind of having to tie up loose ends and start explaining stuff, it sort of started to fall apart, which... The wheels started falling off. Well, that's that's the thing with it. I, I don't know if you watched the TV show Lost, but I say a lot of shows suffer from like what happened to lost which is like making a mystery and not explaining it is so like gripping and captivating but when you eventually get backed into a corner and you're like all right explain all this crazy stuff you've been showing us it's like well well there was a time machine and there was you know it's like okay forget it (laughs) i'm done (laughs) you Uh, lost me (laughs) yeah yeah but that's kind of like what happened with with the show i've been watching but anyway let's get into it this is not why we're here uh, we're here tonight to talk about uh, a case that I've been meaning to cover on this show pretty much since the show has started. That's the sh- the story is the Lost Boys of Pickering, or the Pickering Lost Boys, or the Lost Pickering Boys. Multiple ways that I've seen this kind of phrased, but there's a few things that make this story unique. Is uh, much like last time we spoke about a missing persons case, we talked about the entire Jack family disappearing. In this episode, we're going to be talking about a group of six friends, six boys from Pickering that range in age from 16 to 18, that all together, collectively, at the same time, completely disappear without a trace, which is quite something else. It's, you know, six people. That's a that's a big thing. And yeah, to not leave any shred of evidence is bizarre. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um. I've heard of this case from multiple point of view, from multiple points of view. One is listeners reaching out saying, you know, you should do something on the Pickering Lost Boys. But also, I actually lived in Pickering for a period of time, so I was kind of vaguely familiar with it. My mother lived in Pickering, which is on the outskirts of Toronto. So much like a lot of people in Pickering, she had this big house in Pickering. And then every morning she'd get up early and get on the GO train and the subway and all this other stuff to eventually go downtown Toronto to work, you know, at, in a big tall building somewhere. But I would spend the summers in Pickering with my mother. And it was uh, unlike anywhere in Nova Scotia. Pickering is like true suburbia. There would be I, where my mom lived, I would stand like, I don't know, on the top of a hill. And for as far as the eye could see, it was like the exact same house, you know, the same design, just one after the other with no just yards. Just cookie forever. cutter. Oh, yeah. But forever. Like uh, my mom's neighborhood was like these giant houses. Again, just as far as the eye could see with the same color brick and the same roof. And uh, being where I'm Weird. from in Cape Breton, it looks like you know, every house is from like a different era and one house would have like, you know, one half of the house is pink and the other half is like brick and, you know, it's just like a crazy town. I go to Pickering, I'd be like, well, man, these people are organized. Just just polar opposites of what you're used to. Yeah, certainly. But um, I remember like well, the, other than just the little things about Pickering, I remember I remember being told the story of the Pickering Lost Boys um by like one summer i was there like again spending the summer there i think i was skateboarding and met some kids in the neighborhood and this probably would have been like 98 or something so this story would have been fresh and i remember someone telling me the story of this you know group of boys that had disappeared just a couple years prior and no one knows what happened and it's like unsolved mysteries and and i just i never really dug too deep into the story And then when I started the podcast nighttime and had it recommended and requested a few times, I've always put off learning the story, being like, I'm going to wait till the time comes that I sit down and cover it, that I read about it. So I'm really coming into this fresh. I've only spent the last probably three days reading things and learning for the first time, like what actually happened in this case. And yeah, I see why so many people talk about this and cover it um, because it's fascinating and it's a pure mystery do you remember how you learned about it because you covered it on your youtube i believe i did i covered it on yeah tiktok youtube um it's actually my most successful series on tiktok isn't that something yeah the first part has like half a million views or something like that so that's really great but i just rewatched them and the sound doesn't sync up Okay. It's, it's very annoying. Anyway, so when we're, when we're done but, here, you're going to go fix your old video? 
Is that what pretty you're much. I'm yeah. Like, do I do I delete this? Yeah. But I can't. I'm trying to think. I can't remember how I would have first heard about them. I imagine someone suggested them to me. Mm -hmm. Um. And I, I'm sure I've read about them at some point, but I just, someone probably suggested them and then I looked them up and thought, hmm. Is that how mo most of your, uh, your sh topics come from listener or viewer suggestions? A lot, yeah. Yeah. Mine, I, I kind of got that way now, but it wasn't initially. But a lot of what happens to me is like I spend so much time working on the podcast that if something pops up in the news that I'm interested in, I can't like stop what I'm doing and follow it unless I'm going to cover it. So something interesting will happen in the news that I want to follow. So I'm like, I guess I'm making an episode about that next week. And that, that happens to me a lot. But the Pickering Lost Boys, I certainly got a bunch of a bunch of emails about it and recommendations and requests. But you mentioned it was your most successful video. And in a way, it surprises me, but in a way not. What's What surprised me is when I was trying to do research on this case, find articles and whatnot, I, I was finding more videos of like YouTubers and TikTokers and bloggers covering it than I was of like mainstream media. Like it seems like, yeah, there's your typical articles on the anniversary every year. Somebody wrote a book or two about it. But for every like article that had, you know, firsthand interviews with, you know, uh, one of the missing boys, parents or siblings or something, I'd find five videos on YouTube of, you know, someone just recounting the details of the case, which is kind of wild. Like it, it in That's a way, what I noticed the first time I covered it. Yeah. In is, a way, it's yeah. high profile, but then in a way, it, you know, it isn't. I wonder if it more if th there was a specific video or someone covered it a content cre creator covered it a couple years ago and I wonder if that just like was a trajectory into putting it back into people's minds or it, it could have been yeah like if cuz yeah. you see that in especially in podcasting if one of the big shows cover you know you know whatever Paul Bernardo's crimes or something you will see all all of these like uh like smaller podcasts will cover it in the upcoming weeks because everybody is again talking about this case again. Yeah, it could very well be something like that. But uh, but you I'm know what? Even I was surprised when I first covered it on TikTok. A lot of the comments were, I'm from Pickering and I've never heard of this. And I'm so like, something. Pickering is not that big. <laughs> like, no, but this, this so happened. I was really surprised. Yeah, but it's yeah, stories fade fast. And That's true. when you think of a story in 1995, me, that doesn't seem like that long ago. Uh, I was having cigarettes in Pickering in 1995 <laughs> um, as a 14-year-old punk. But um, when you think of it, that's, you know, that's almost 30 years ago. So there are people, a lot of people that are writing those comments on TikTok, like unless their parents told them about the Pickering Lost Boys, you know, True. in in um, in lieu of like a Netflix documentary or something reigniting the case. Yeah, a lot of people would learn about that for the first time. I get that a lot. I'll cover something from my hometown or, or some city that in Canada that for me is like a like a well known story, and I'll I'll hear from people there like, "Well, I'm from there, and I had no idea." And I'm like, "Nothing else has ever happened in your town, and you don't know about the one like thing that happened." You know, like what? There's been a few stories like that. I'm like, "Huh, huh. amazing." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but this one, we'll, we'll start getting into it here. We we said a bit already. This takes place. March 17th of 1995. Uh, the time of year, I think, is important because this story, for better or worse, is going to take us onto the water of Lake Ontario. I couldn't imagine going in a boat in the middle of the night in March. Because it's like Ontario, it's not like it's cold. That would be cold, right? I, it doesn't seem like a water time of year to me. Oh, definitely not. But it's not like they were planning on going swimming. Yeah, that's... Uh, and, and we'll get into that if they even went in the water. So that, that's a whole other kind of can of worms. But the story centers around six boys. Um, there is Danny Higgins, the youngest of the group at 16 years old. Chad Smith, the oldest, 18. Jamie Lefebvre, 17. Michael Cummings, 17. Robbie Rumbolt, 17. And that is a wicked name, Robbie Rumbolt. Sounds like a football Sounds like player. a wrestler. Yeah. Uh, and then there is Jay Boyle, 17. And when you read about this story, it seems like Jay Boyle is the one for whatever reason, a, a lot of what's written is about him. Maybe that's because 
his uh, family and partner have spoke out more publicly than others, perhaps, or also it could be because he had a young child. He had a daughter at the time that he, that this happened and he went missing. And a lot of people will say, you know, Jay never would have left willingly and left his daughter behind. You know, something happened. They, he didn't just, they didn't run off to the States or some crazy thing like that. But, um, again, Jay Boyle, for whatever reason, seems to be the most prominently discussed of the group of them. I haven't been able to learn too much about the boys other than, um, again, what I said about, uh, about Jay, uh, having a, having a child. Um, but overall it, it sounds like they're regular 17 year olds, maybe the leaning a bit more towards the wild side. Um, thinking like, you know, stealing boats is something that it sounds like they've done at least two or three times. That to me is, a, is, you know, that's a bit of a wild thing. When you read about their lives and what they were up to, I think they were like, it kind of sounded like uh, they were 17 going on 21 or, you know, if, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, they were, they sounded like fun. I'm not condoning what they did, but they sounded like a lot of fun. <laughs> Yeah. To me. Yeah. <laughs> well, to you when you're 17. Right, exactly. I have a feeling tonight you don't have any wild plans. Oh, no. <laughs> As you're no, surrounded no. by cats with your new shelf behind you. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a <laughs> <you see. laughs> um, But yeah, it's like when, when you hear, I think when people hear the story, there's probably going to be someone who listens, who says something like, if you do something stupid and illegal and, you know, I, I think what they were up to that night probably wasn't completely out of the ordinary for what a, gr a group of six, 17 and 18 year olds get up to when they're out on their own late at night drinking right. and whatnot. Because th this party start or this party, this story starts at a host party. I couldn't figure out too much about the host party other than it wasn't like a get together. I've, I've heard 50 to a hundred people at someone's house, which to me is a pretty big party is my understanding. That's shaker. Is that your understanding? Is that it was something pretty significant? Oh yeah. No, I, I wasn't under the impression. It was just like small gathering. Okay. I've, I've it heard. Was, Cause it was spring break. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So this would have so been. They were like. Because I think I looked on the calendar and March 17th was like a Tuesday or okay. something like that. Okay. So, yeah, they were they were having a good time. Yeah. In March break, it's it's that's a week of Saturdays for anyone who exactly. does not celebrate at March break. So Tuesday was Saturday. Um, on exactly. Break. The, they're at a party. It's just before 1 a.m. that they the group or I think five of the six leave the party and tell some others we're going to go to the marina to screw around a bit, I think is about what they said. Does that make sense to you? So that also tells me this is not the first time they've done this. Yeah, I think or actually I think what they said was goof around at, on a boat on or a boat. goof around at the marina. But they've at least made it clear we're heading towards the marina or the waterfront or where the boats are, which in Pickering, there's kind of like a park area where there's like yacht clubs and, you know, Lake Ontario's there, which... Uh, for people who've never visited, when you hear lake, you you probably think large body of water. Lake Ontario, uh, quite literally, is a great lake. It's very big, and it's it's not like your typical lake that you would go out on in a canoe or something. It's a significant body of water. Can you see across it? I like, don't can you think see? So. Yeah, like it's it's huge. <laughs> if so, it'd be the kind of thing where there'd just be this. Like, I think it takes like a couple hours to boat across it. So, yeah, you, I don't think you'd be able to see. Maybe on a crystal clear day, you'd be able to see something. Let's let's go with that. Okay. Um, but they end up leaving the party. After they leave, they stop at one of the one of the six's home. He wasn't with them at the party, but they stop at his house and collect him. And that is the last known sighting of the boys um or the last time they're actually seen i think the first thing that raises concern is a couple hours later and we'll, we'll get back to what we know about their whereabouts but a couple hours later after leaving to goof around on a boat stopping at one of their houses and collecting them they don't arrive back at the party and one of their girlfriends makes the first call to police i think around 3 30 a.m there okay. were a couple girlfriends that were like 
they should be back by now. Mm -hmm. So I think they tried to report them missing and the police were like, if they don't show up by like later in the morning, come back with their parents. Yeah. Th yeah. Cause there, they there, did. there was two separate calls to, you know, missing persons reports or whatever at three 30, the first one, like, yeah, like you said, it's, you know, they haven't been back because they've been gone for three hours. Uh, I can, I'm not surprised that the police didn't, you know, all hands on deck jump into that. But right. hindsight being 2020, oh my God, it would have made a difference, I think, if they did. Well, I can see why the girlfriends would have been super worried right away. Water is water and drunk teens. That's not good. Yeah, oh, that yeah. is yeah. bad. Like <laughs> Water and alcohol do not go yeah. well together. And it doesn't. And then, you know, without... Uh, experienced swimmers and boat drivers and all this stuff yeah that's just that is well, a bad I imagine mix. they had done this before and always came back so mm -hmm. when they didn't they were like ooh something something's up so here's what we know about what they did do or where they did go is there's really two clips of surveillance or CCTV footage that tell the story one shows a group of the boys a group of the six stealing beer from a boat so i guess that you know just climbing on the boat and going into a fridge and taking a few beer um and then another clip simply shows them entering the marina where all the boats are in either video you don't see everyone together so there's still some um you know loose ends about if they were all there or not but we do know that they were that some of them were there they were all together earlier in the night you know hours before and they were stealing beer at least from one boat which again i understand is something that they had done before they were familiar with that specific boat yeah. and then and this is what's interesting in this story despite getting well one of the many things that's interesting despite having so much conversation about it and so much coverage on different youtubers and bloggers and all this stuff there's really only a few details that you can go on so they leave the party to go goof around on a boat they're seen entering the marina through horrible cop uh, quality cctv footage and are videoed uh, stealing liquor or beer or whatever from one of the boats on horrible cctv footage they're never seen again coincidentally a boat and a i think they call it an aqua bike or a water tricycle are reported missing from that marina the next day by the owners so putting you know two and two together and tying it all together the police the next day when or i think it was actually two days later when they started putting this all together when they realized oh there's six boys who are missing and now we have a boat and a water tricycle reported missing this may all be connected we got to start searching lake ontario before we get into the search and what they found did you look at any videos or pictures of a water tricycle I sure did. They look like a lot of fun. They look amazing. So a water tricycle. And also they look easy to steal. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. it's <laughs> It basically looks like uh, a, like a giant tricycle, but ex instead of like big wheels, it has like, well, I guess it has huge wheels that are hollow plastic so they would float. So if you were driving one of those in the water, you would be bobbing up and down on top of waves and whatnot. It's like and a paddle boat tricycle. Yeah, it's it's hard to explain, but the wheels kind of have the paddles built into them. So as you're right. as you're pedaling and the wheels are spinning, the paddles are turning and propelling you forward. It doesn't look like the kind of thing that you would, you know, sink and drown. Like it, it to me it doesn't look like something dangerous at all. And then the other thing is the boat that's missing, and this will become important. So the water tricycle is something that's traditionally not dangerous. Um, the boat that was missing is called, uh, it was an imitation version of a model called a Boston Whaler, which is advertised as an unsinkable boat. It's like a small, what I would call like a small fishing boat. But what makes this style of boat unique is that inside the boat, like the way it's constructed, of course, it's like fiberglass or plastic or whatever, but inside it's full of this like styrofoam kind of foam stuff that's buoyant so they say you could take one of these boats and you could saw it right down the middle and it would then just be two things floating on top of the water you could fill it with water and it will just sit on top of the water it's advertised and promoted and largely thought to be an unsinkable boat 
the reason I lean on that is because the boat was missing, the water tricycle is missing, the six boys are missing. None of it was ever found in a lake that is a confined space that was searched by a variety of using a variety of means. They have never found any sign with, I guess, with one minor exception. And this also seems to have a a bit of a star. They found something on the other side of the lake. I think it's about 120 kilometers across, which would have been in New York. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Where was it? It I should have this right in front of me. Somewhere in New York. Yeah. But but what did they find in New York? A gas can from from what would have been an imitation Boston whaler. Yeah. But nothing has been definitively proven that this yeah. belonged to the boat. I, I found like what I found interesting is why did they even go through the trouble? Like someone in New York or some some business on the waterfront somewhere in New York, a gas can floats up. I wonder why they even took the trouble to report it because it was found like it wasn't like days later. I think it was found like way after two weeks. Fact. Yeah, two, I think it was two weeks after. I'm just I'm surprised that it even got uh, brought to the surface as far as attention goes. And they couldn't rule it out as being, you know, that, you know, this definitely isn't from that boat. It it was it's at least um, consistent with the type of gas can that would have been on that style of boat. But aside from that, there's literally nothing. That boat wasn't one of a kind. So, no, and it it was an it wasn't said to be in great condition. It was a little older, but still the fact that the, but like to sink that boat would be a chore that said, uh, we'll, we'll get into some theories at the end, but that said, if someone finds a boat floating around with no people in it, they may just take that boat. So that boat could, you know, who knows where it is at this point, but I think the many people who know boats better than you and I do, um, have said, uh, yeah, that boat didn't sink. I don't believe it. Oh, yeah, so we'll we'll see. Um, but we'll get into uh, we'll get into some see, I'm, theories. As I'm we skeptical because like the Titanic was supposed to be unsinkable too. So yeah, saying a boat is unsinkable, it, come it's it's water. It's pretty unforgiving. Like yeah, but but that said, you fill some. Uh, Titanic's a different story because it's just this massive right. metal thing. But take a small thing that's stuffed with like you know packed with a styrofoam sort of stuff that's buoyant. Um, you, you could break it into a hundred pieces and then there's just going to be a hundred pieces of styrofoam floating around on the surface. Uh, they never found anything like that. Exactly. And that's, yeah. And this, this was described as a massive search. We're talking thousands of volunteers on foot, uh, Marine units of police, uh, sea helicopters, um, basically, you know, any means they could to search Lake Ontario nothing well and they started that like as soon as they realized that the boys were reported missing and then the two reported watercrafts were reported missing they started the search mm-hmm. so like there was they couldn't have gotten far you know yeah it's and just like it doesn't it doesn't add up like if yeah. they had started the search weeks later i would have said like okay you know what are you expecting to find but mm-hmm. like they didn't you know there wasn't too many hours that passed. Yeah, it, it was as far as like getting out there on the water and finding a boat with a couple like thirsty guys in it. I think it was too late for that, but it wasn't so late that, you know, no sign of anything. And, the, and right. again, we're talking now almost 30 years later, nobody washed ashore of six. The boat never washed ashore or turned up. Like I think like all of that is such a mystery um, and, and seems unus- unusual in a lake as opposed to, you know, far into the ocean or, you know, something of that nature. Um, there was now one thing about this story as we, we get going is as years have passed, there's a lot of little kind of details that surface, but don't go anywhere. And it's really hard to get to the source of where this info came from. Um, one thing that has been said is that at one point, there was um, a shipwreck located, but not investigated. Do you know anything about well, where that came from? Or reported? No, I have no idea. I read it somewhere. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's there's I quite. I can't remember where I would where where I would have read that. Yeah, but and there's there's quite a bit of that. And fortunately for this story, there's one guy in particular who really uh, he's a private investigator turned, I guess turned author. Um, that's really connected to the story. His name is Bruce Pickett's. Uh, in about 2010, he took on the case, I think as, I don't think he was like hired by anyone. My understanding is he just kind of like got interested and took it on. And he has been like, if you read about this story, you will find his name and his work and him writing over and over again through the story. He's like uh, recently published a book about it. He seems to maintain most of the Facebook content uh, either maintain or curate or just, you know, communicate on. So a lot of things that have, you know, come and went over the years are, are stuff that he's been able to get to the surface um, through, you know, the private investigating kind of digging and those means. But again, nothing like a value um, that that would lead anywhere. The biggest lead, it seems, over the last several years that's been discussed is, you um, Bruce Pickett's the PI. He got I think it's Ricketts with an R. Is it Rickett? I thought it was Ricketts. Rick, uh, Ricketts sounds better. Yeah, Bruce Ricketts. He got access to the full, I believe, 16-hour long copy of the CCTV footage from the marina the night that the boys were there and the night that the boys went missing. Uh, he watched it and examined it all. And again, I, I skimmed through it. He published it on YouTube and on Facebook. It's very, very poor quality like one thing in watching it i realize how much or, or the improvements in cctv footage from 1995 to 2023 i think we're in um but anyway in watching it the, the biggest lead that seemed to come up is right around the same time that the boys enter and are there you see a couple other people enter separately you can't really see it's it's hard to even say if it's male or female at one point they're thought to be pointing at something but it, it's even hard to tell but the biggest piece of info to come out is that it looks like there was at least someone else there that night that may have seen something so there was a lot of media coverage reaching out to like if you were these people that were there come forward maybe you saw something but as far as like eyewitness accounts of the boys being there or doing anything other than the CCTV footage that we've talked about. The only other thing is someone who lives not far from there uh, reported hearing uh, the sound of a boat's engine around three in the morning, which would have been about the right time if they did get on a boat and start it up, start it up and go out in the water. So I think it's, it's reasonable to think that the boats being stolen and the boys being there, and disappearing are all connected. It would be a pretty big coincidence. I've heard speculation that somebody had used the disappearance of the boys as a way to, you know, um, wreck their boat and get insurance, you know, like something like that. And I'm like, well, that seems like a, how evil would you have to be? Oh, those kids are missing. I'm going to make it look like they took my boat and get the three grand. Right. The three I, grand. I, whatever. I don't know what the boats were, but it, probably more than that. But uh, it's still, I don't believe that. I think when you look at the facts of this case, if they have a history of sneaking on boats and stealing stuff and maybe taking boats, I'm thinking a, 17, a group of 17, 18 year olds are down on the water at the marina and see um, an unlocked water tricycle. One of one member of that group is going to be like, I'm getting on it. Watch this. If I, not more, it, yeah. at the very least, one mem one party. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, that's there's no way one doesn't. It just it's human nature. Uh, starting the boat and going out in the water is a different story. I think that's I think that would be at the part where somebody in the group is like, whoa, like, uh, you know, this is going a little far, but I could still. I could still I have see this it. feeling that they weren't out to like trash this boat. They were going to take it out for a joy ride and probably bring it back. They probably had done it before. Mm -hmm. The keys were probably under the seat or under the mat. I know farmers here leave their keys to their tractors under the mat and kids in small towns like steal tractors and just like move them. Really? Do uh, Is cow tipping actually a thing? I've definitely never done it. I've heard of it. And I'm like, that sounds weird. That sounds a hard. Do you know how much a cow weighs? Well, so what you do, cow tipping is the cow's asleep in the field and you can push it and it'll just fall over, right? 
Yeah, I don't know. Something about that doesn't make sense to me. I've heard about people doing this, and I'm like, mm. okay. if that's true, that's weird. <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, joy riding a boat um, in the middle of the night's a little weird, but I again, it's uh, that's besides the point. Um, <laughs> let's say, just for the sake of argument, the boys get in a boat or on that tricycle or both, and they end up in the water. How do or they end up out in the water in these vehicles? How do they end up? disappearing that's yeah that's what it comes down to mm -hmm. and police were pretty quick after two days of searching they were like okay well it's pretty obvious they like capsized and either drowned or succumbed to hypothermia or which and they're, it, they're which in, in march it wouldn't take long you end up in the water in march i think um you're not gonna and last I, very long i already mentioned this but i often underestimate how unforgivable water is mm -hmm. it, like that lake ontario is deep and cold some mm -hmm. things sink and don't come back up yeah and if you're out of good ways oh. it's pitch dark um Ooh. the other thing too is if it if you've spent lots of times in pools and lakes and oceans and rivers and all this stuff if you, you swim with a lot of people if anyone's ever having trouble and you try to help them or even if you're just kind of wrestling around in the water if you have someone else grabbing you it's really hard to swim and i think when i hear this story and try to imagine what had happened i'm thinking six guys with their clothes on if one of them ends up in the water and one or two of them jump in to help them i think it very quickly could devolve into a super dangerous situation and you know if for whatever if but again, none of them come back. So something has to happen that leads to all six of them in the water. And it's like, I can't imagine like one guy falls and someone jumps in to help him. Then someone jumps in to help the two of them, you know. Well, and they... not only not only do none of the boys come back, but the the boats don't come back. Mm. Not a hat comes back, a jacket, a shoe. Mm. Well, like nothing, nothing returns. Well, we can get into this whole t idea of uh, there, there was a pair of red pants that had washed right. up uh on the U.S. side, I believe. Well, two, two, the remains of two bodies were found along the Niagara River, and one was wearing these red pants. Yes, that's right. And I've read multiple things about these bodies in the Niagara River, but what ultimately convinced me that this is likely unrelated is there was an expert... I don't know what field of science it is, but that studies, you know, the direction of water and tides and currents and all this stuff. And what the their ruling was that it would be or their opinion was that it would be impossible that these would be the boys because the body of water that this was all found in fed into Lake Ontario. And it wouldn't be something you would that would like wash down that way. Like they would have had to actually oh. driven the boat down that way and it wouldn't have made sense to go that far. Okay. You know, and but then again, I've also read on a bunch of places that people are like, no, this is for sure, at least two of them. So this, the way that expert phrased it and and uh, gave their opinion, I was like, yeah, I like I, I I'm agreeing with this person. But the um, the two bodies were never tested for DNA. There was actually like a civilian kind of I don't know if it was GoFundMe, but it was like something like that where they were trying to raise money. To have dna testing done i don't believe it was ever completed last i saw was a couple years back they were still trying to raise some money for this which seems like for the sake of just making the families feel better someone should have just because the police like how much does it cost to test dna when you're, well, you know and it, it can't be much like you wouldn't think right especially for a high profile case like this but i don't i don't work there so i don't know yeah um we don't know for sure DNA didn't uh, confirm or rule out or whatever who it is. But one thing that has become a talking point is one of the remains that were found had a pair of red pants on. Um, one of the missing boys was believed to have been or had regularly wore a pair of red Levi's and was believed to have been wearing them when the when they disappeared. This was Chad Smith. Or no, sorry, it was Danny Higgins, I believe, that had the... Uh, I think it was Jay Boyle. It was Jay Boyle. Oh, yes, yeah, you're right. It, they were his pants. Yeah. Um, the pants nowadays, they were reported as being found as red, but they've been in the water so long that they actually look more like orange. So there's some debate about, are they red pants or are they orange pants? Are they Levi's or are they not Levi's? 
So well, it's, it's reported that he was wearing red Levi, like they were jeans, they were denim. Yeah. And and once Bruce Ricketts actually got his hands on these pants that had been like lost in translation for years, they were yeah not only orange but a different fa- fabric altogether. Okay. Which leads to the question: Was the evidence improperly documented or tampered with? Hmm. But uh, yeah. I've seen a lot of discussion about, you know, is this like this reeks of cover off tampered with? I, I've i never seen anything yet that would tell me why there would have been uh, hokey pokey, hinky dinky kind of stuff going on. Is there, is I there don't, any? I don't think the tampering, like it just in my opinion, I don't think, I think the evidence was lost and replaced. They were mm. like, oh shit. We, we lost this vital evidence in this big case and now someone wants it. Mm-hmm. I need you to go get me an orange pair of pants. Yeah, like, yeah, you know? I get you. But, and, and this time, like this happens in 95, that's kind of a shaky time because that's just as DNA is becoming like the go-to thing right. for everything. Like, you know, if, if it had been... If and this, it wasn't what it is now. Yeah, certainly. Although it's not that long ago in terms of the way evidence is handled and considering DNA, I think things are... A hell of a lot different um so when i think of this story and i try to guess what may have happened um or at least co- try to come up with something that would even make sense the really the only things that i come up with is someone fell in or, or two people fell in and others tried to help them and it became even worse and this is the what ended up happening um but that wouldn't explain the disappearance of the boat and the aqua tricycle water tricycle so then I think, well, maybe the two boats, you know, uh, they were out there and the boat hit the water tricycle or whatever, and they both got damaged and sunk. That doesn't necessarily ring uh, true to me either because of what I read about this boat. If it is, in fact, one that was made using like a foam core, that uh, the boat, I just, I don't even see how there would have been that much damage. The water tricycle isn't like this big heavy thing it would be just like i don't know just be like driving your boat into a bicycle that was in the water you know it wouldn't be the kind of thing that would split it into 100 pieces and everyone sink no no i don't think so but i also think if it were to like be capsized at one point it wouldn't fare well this tricycle but you I feel say like that, it would but, tumble really easily but i feel like yeah maybe it would tumble easily because it's probably a little top heavy but even if it tumble, I feel like it would just continue to float upside down. Like if you take right, if you take three big plastic floaty things and put a metal frame on it, it's just it's going to float whether it's the right side up or wrong way or whatever. Yeah. Like I feel like that thing should still like unless something crazy happened, that thing should just be upside down floating. In unless the someone tied an anchor to it, it, sh- it shouldn't have sank. Yeah, that's a good point, and that opens the door for that discussion is there is some speculation there could be foul play um that said i've never seen anything compelling to tell me that these boys were at any risk of anything like people had talked about this uh, body of water being used by drug traffickers um maybe it was but why would a drug trafficker like, like what are the chances that these guys joyriding a boat in a water tricycle would end up becoming targets for this group of drug traffickers who would just want to get the drugs across and get home without causing a scene. I what just... if they weren't targets, though? And what if they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time? Possibly. Saw something, saw something they shouldn't have. And... Yeah, I just, I just... Them and the boats were never seen again. Like, it could be, but there's lots of things you could like yeah that could have happened um you know oh, it's it, just a theory it, it's a theory but without any strong backup like it's just something you can't you can't rule it out there's no way to say no that definitely didn't happen it's just it's something like that could help explain it you know they well i think it's just because it's such an unexplainable case mm-hmm. people people reach for ideas they're like okay what could have happened yeah like i feel you, you could probably sit down with a pen and paper and write 50 ideas like here's 50 things that could explain the disappearance of six boys a boat and a water tricycle in lake ontario 
Uh, and actually, I think you'd have a hard time coming up with 50. 50, yeah. 10, maybe. And if in and you could say whether you want to say drug traffickers, it, it could be you could say anybody who didn't want to be seen on the water was seen by the boys. They got the boys and hid the boat and hid the water tricycle. Something you know, the, it covered it in concrete and sunk it to the bottom. You know, whether it's a drug trafficker or some guy who's out there because uh, he just killed his wife and he's hiding the body and they see him hiding his wife's body and. She's coincidentally wearing orange pants that end up, up, you know, like, I hate to laugh at that. That's a, that was a dark thing to laugh at. Um, but you get what I mean. Totally. And, but you know what? Stranger things, man. Like some weird shit has happened. So well, I don't absolutely. put anything off the table. Um, imagine being living, imagine living in Pickering at this time, being in like school with these kids and being like six right? of my friends disappeared. That would be so, that would rattle your high school. Yeah. And I, I think they're from different parts of Ontario, of that, I don't know what you would call it, the Toronto area. They were from different areas. So I don't think they went to the same school, but they were at least in the same social group. Yeah. And like definitely. in six people, that's a big group of people. Like I, I know in high school, I had a friend who died in a car accident with a drunk driver. And that was like such a shock and it like it rocked everybody and it, like it was such a huge kind of moment in my childhood and for everyone in my community. Imagine six people at once in a way that you can't even explain what happened to them. It's it's just, just unimaginable. Yeah. yeah. And like the it's Jack, strange. like last week when we talked or two weeks ago when we talked about the Jack family. I guess it's a similar thing. It's I guess it's a bit different because it's a family with like that was like kids and adults where this is just a group of young, healthy boys starting their life. I can't imagine an accident going so wrong that not one of them is able to make it out. Right. It's mm -hmm. just it's it seems implausible. Mm -hmm. um, one other theory that gets tossed around a lot, and so we'll make sure we put this on our list of 10 or 50 ideas, is uh, Lake Ontario has cargo ships, boats going back and forth from U.S. to Canada, delivering goods. And they're like, yes, it's a lake. And so when people think of lake, they think of small you know, fishing boats or whatever, uh, recreational vehicles puttering around. These cargo ships are like giant ships and if you at night if, if at night you did you got in the way of one of them that boat you would be demolished it would take you out and when we talk about something breaking one of those boats into a thousand pieces this would be the kind of thing that could do it so a lot of people who are trying to come up with an explanation of how they they all end up in the water in the boat and water tricycle end up disappearing the idea that they got in front of a cargo ship accidentally um is um it, it would make sense or it would it, it's a theory that would explain it um however cargo ships keep tight records and there's no record of one of those boats traveling that night so it's kind of a dead lead yeah what what if the drug smugglers had a cargo ship a drug smuggler would Speaking on behalf of the drug smuggling community that I'm like well in, entrenched in, they would have like a quiet boat <laughs> that is fast. So they would have like a small. Not a cargo ship. They wouldn't have a cargo ship <laughs> they, they, across Lake Ontario. Um, they would they would travel in like a small little. Um, I'm like just a, throwing out ideas. <laughs> your idea is that drug smugglers in a cargo ship. <laughs> no it would be a it would be a, a drug smugglers would because it's not like they're taking a cargo ship of drugs they're they have like a couple suitcases uh, of it i guess they would have a small boat that's fast and quiet and able to you know get the job done quickly and evade detection from you know uh, coast guard or police or you know whoever's going to be watching not a massive cargo ship no i i don't think that's it Perhaps um, I was just thinking out loud. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely not editing that out, though. That's in. Um, another theory. This, anytime you talk about a missing person's case, 
this will come up. What if these six boys have decided that, you know, life in Pickering isn't what they want. They're all together going to uh, fake this event as a way to cover their tracks so they can go to God knows where and start life anew. That theory comes up as a possible explanation in pretty much every missing persons case. Um, I, I cannot imagine a group of six, 16, 17, 18 year olds make that decision and all stick to it all make these that years. Pact and yeah, no. I could see them making the pact to like do something nuts. Like let's all just, you know, take a boat and go across the water, go to New York and gamble, you know, something like this. Right. But it's not, not start a new life. No, in whatever you were into or doing or decisions you made at 16, 17, 18, you would have changed your mind a hundred times by the time you were 26. So the idea that all six of them don't return, I just, I don't see any merit. I don't, I can't imagine a world in which that happens. No. And to do it successfully, they, they started searching long before they could get far enough to disappear for good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so. I think, and I think it goes without saying is there's been no activity on bank accounts or anything like that. Like there's no sign of life from um, any of these boys other than a couple. Um, and actually this is another thing that it seems to be a consistent uh, kind of feature of missing persons cases. There have been several uh, unconfirmed sightings. Um, one of the boys was thought to be seen walking down the highway one was thought to be or walking in a road in the direction of his house, I think. One was thought to be seen at like a Burger King. But all in New of New York. Yeah, but all of these sightings, um none were able to be corroborated to be them. It's it, it was just kind of like tips that came in when police and investigators and media were soliciting tips. Right. And yeah, when you're when you're looking for someone everyone's got a doppelganger too so yeah and when you're I, actively like searching for someone people are gonna are gonna fit that yeah um and it's again it it, it always comes up but it's um unless there was like compelling info like cctv footage or something it's it's just a tip that with so little to go on in this case it's a tip that I, I, eyewitness accounts are never reliable. Exactly. Like, yeah. Um, Two people can watch the same thing and, and remember it differently. So yeah. here's something to get into uh, this. I, I had talked about like, why would there be, or I had, I had cornered and questioned you on this idea of like, why would there be a cover up or what would they be hiding in Bruce Ricketts work, he again, he's the private investigator that is largely at least the public side of this investigation is he's leading it, wrote a book about it, blogs about it regularly and does a lot of interviews about it, or at least did. Um, he got a lot of documents from both American and Canadian officials concerning the investigation and the search for these boys with a complaint from him and being echoed by family members and media that um, the documents they're receiving are heavily redacted to the point of almost being useful with like full paragraphs, uh, considerable amounts of details being redacted. That's one thing I cannot get my head around is why after almost 30 years, what they would be hiding or protecting if they didn't see it as an investigation into like a possible homicide or something, I just feel like at this point it's a, it's with the passage of time and with what's at least what's known publicly, there doesn't seem to be a very good reason to hold your cards that tight after all these years. Right. And we'll even getting the, the security footage that looks like it was recorded on a toaster. Yeah. It, it took an him old multiple. Toaster. Yes. It took him multiple tries to get that, and they told him it didn't exist at one point. Mm -hmm. It's like, what do you, what's, well, what, you, what's going on here? Yeah, it was like they. I, I saw an interview with one of the family. I think it was one of the mothers. It was like saw the videos, the CCTV footage, and then a couple years later tried to access them again, and they were and was told like, no, no, they like that doesn't exist. We don't have that. And it's like, no, I like you showed me them before. 
Um, but yeah, when you say recorded on a toaster, like it is such awful, awful quality. It's, it's, it's a shame. And at no point do you see all the boys together on the video. So it's still like speculation. Were they even there together? And then on top of that, the, the video and what cameras are recording is a little sketchy. It looks like one of kind of the main, most important cameras that would have been looking in the area where the action would have happened was off for the majority of the night without any explanation why it wasn't recording. Yeah. But what if one of the boys purposely shut it down? They were so familiar with the marina. They were like, take care of that security camera. Like, like Jason Bourne. He like climbed up. Yeah. Yeah, you like, never know. Cameras down. We're getting the boats. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't see it being that. Maybe we got to hide from the international drug smugglers in the cargo ship. Uh, I don't. I don't see that being likely. But I think it's you know that when you look at the quality of the video taken by this CCTV camera, I also would say it probably is the type of camera that's not that reliable. That's true. Um, I just, I'd bet it being faulty over tampered with yeah and you you hear so many and, and talk about and read about so many stories where there was a camera pointed right where you wanted to see and for whatever you know that the tape was taped over or the thing wasn't on or it wasn't even a real camera it's been broken for years but we just keep it there because it makes the hotel look safe you know that sort of thing but when push comes to shove like with so many of these mysteries if there had only been a working quality camera you know, it would save a, a lot of people 30 years of, you know, where is my son and his friends? And uh, it's um, it's just unimaginable. And again, one of them had w went missing with a young daughter who's now like a woman. Yeah, she's would, like almost 30. She'd be yeah, like my age. Never, never known her dad. Um, we, of course, wouldn't have memories of from being a baby, but to be brought up with among the shadow of like, yeah, we don't necessarily know what happened to him. And, and it's, and over time, like when I was going through the articles and videos and news reports, watching and learning about this, I mean, I was even seeing the story change. One of the more recent pieces I just watched was uh, this news clip that made it sound like they were dry. It was like, I don't know what news. It was one of the major news sites. So I don't know if it was CBC or CTV or Global or whatever. But it made it sound like they were out on their own boat and had a boating accident and went into the water and this accidental thing. But that's I think that's like it's leaving out a lot of important nuances. Like for one, we don't even know for sure if they were on a boat because there's no real evidence of that. It's just... That's kind of... It's, it's all circumstantial. Yeah, it just would make the most sense that they ended up on that boat. or up Right. Boat. Um, at this point, if they haven't been found, I can't imagine that there will be an end to this one way or another. It will take... Well, I guess it could take some technology, like, uh, you know, radar that scans the bottom of the water and stuff. Like, if, if you watch these kind of... So it bothers me. If you watch like the treasure hunting shows, like the Curse of Oak Island, they spend like hundreds of thousands of dollars working on this stuff that looks into the ground and they're digging, hoping to find gold and they end up not finding anything. Can they not just make a documentary show called like Finding the Lost Boys of Pickering, where they just go out on the water with a big budget and spend money using some kind of radar to scan the bottom for a wreckage of a and, water like, at tricycle? At the very least... They'd, they'd probably find something that would find that would a... justify a season two of the show. Yeah, exactly. Um, but but there... well, when I posted on TikTok, there were many comments and lots of people claimed that there are like it's so deep that it's unsearchable. And there are like 150 year old shipwrecks on the bottom of Lake Ontario that really? are just like sitting there. I don't know. I haven't looked into this. Uh, well, and you know, and you know, I believe anything I'm told. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so. If so, that's fascinating. And I love this idea of just like these mysteries that are just kind of hiding around us. And, you know, there's the human mysteries, like what we're talking about now with like a missing persons case. But then the mysteries like below water, like what's deep under there, you know, and, and then there's a bunch of mud. What's under that mud, you know, and it's... It's the fact that they know more about space than the ocean. 
Like it's, yeah, it's scary. Yeah, I'm Water also, is terrifying. Yeah, it, it's yeah, and, and it's dark and it's mysterious. Uh, I'm a big and fan. Unforgiving. Yeah, I'm a fan of the writing and only the writing of H.P. Lovecraft, who uh, he was a writer from back in the day. But a lot of his, he wrote a lot of short kind of they call it weird fiction, which is just kind of I guess something between sci-fi, fantasy, and horror short stories. And he had quite a few that would be set in, you know, things coming out of the water or deep down in the water. You would find, you know, this temple of this like lost race that existed, you know, 100,000 million years ago or whatever. And it just always left me with this idea of like, you know, there's some weird, cool stuff down there. Um, but in this case, I think it's highly likely that there is a water tricycle and another boat down there or at least evidence of it and you know if you could crack a case like this at this point that'd be a huge feather in a cap for some kind of like i don't know exploratory research water kind of company why doesn't some upstart company just solve this yeah i don't know i i wish i had the money to i don't maybe it's easier said than done it could be one of those things i wonder because yeah i I, I like i said i often underestimate how how deep the natural bodies of water can yeah. be. And then again, Lake Ontario, the name lake makes me think of the lakes that I swim in in Nova Scotia, which even my area, like a, not far from Halifax, is a place called Dartmouth that a lot of people call the city of lakes because it's just a whole bunch of lakes. But these are the kind of lakes where you can almost throw a rock across them if you got a good arm. Those lake are the lakes I, I'm also familiar with. And, and most people are, you know, or, or a large lake with a bunch of cottages around it. This is an altogether different thing. When you're on Lake Ontario, it feels more like the mouth of an ocean. Like it feels more like you're on a harbor into the ocean or whatever. So it's it's a different lake, I think, than most people are th- would imagine in their heads. Um, but again, six boys go missing in it uh, without any sign is... It's unusual and it's um, it's it's unusual and it's unimaginable what it would be like to l- be associated with these boys and you know and live with this. Uh, in the chat, Thomas says Lake Ontario is seventy three hundred square miles. <laughs> so that yeah, that's not cottage country lake. That doesn't really mean anything to me. Uh, I'm not gonna. What's it like? How big's a square mile? <laughs> one mile this way, one mile that way in a big square. Oh, like flooring. <laughs> okay, I've never seen any work so hard. Weird. I'm reading. <laughs> the lights in the room are flashing as you're <laughs> trying to figure that out. <laughs> uh, and I see the clock behind you is just spinning. <laughs> it's like there's an electrical interference. Uh, the, the, uh, re- <laughs> I'm not going to uh, make fun of you. I'm, I'm holding myself back so any, hard. Anymore. <laughs> um, well, Maddie, do you see any world in which, or do you see any possibility this case gets progressed any further? I think, you know, Bruce Ricketts, a PI that takes it on, that's an investigator, writer, researcher, crowdfunder, all this stuff. I think he's done incredible work getting the story public and propelling it forward, but it needs even more than that. So I don't know, short even, of luck or chance. Well, even if someone were to come forward and say, I was that person in the parking lot and this is what I saw or this is what I heard. I could call that in and say something. We don't have any evidence of anything. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's other than a, a huge, like you said, stroke of luck, fluke. I don't know. I don't know if this will ever be solved. Mm-hmm. Do you, off the top of your head, can you think of any other case like this where it's a group of, other than the Jack family, um, where it's a group of young people together disappearing? Not, I, not off the top of my head. I can think of like I've heard a few stories of like being found dead, a group, and you know that's not necessarily certain what happened to them or what led to it, but just to disappear, I just. Yeah, no like one washes like, the like shore. Suicide pacts mm-hmm. among teenage friends, mm-hmm. but never, never something like this, yeah, and never and, like a successful runaway. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I don't, I don't 
give any credibility or any thought no. to the idea that they ran off. And in just, I know you brought up suicide case, uh, pack, not in terms of this case being a possibility, but just in something that could happen. There's no evidence that anything no. like that. I think it's in my mind, this is pretty clearly a case of death by misadventure. That's how I would, if I had to put my cards down on what I, you know, where I think it, put my chips down where I think the answer is, I think that would be the broad stroke of what I think happened. But what specifically happened? I don't know. I'm going to have to come up with that list of 10 to 50 ideas. Yeah, I don't think anyone knows. Yeah, I, I definitely agree that something bad happened that night. And the boys obviously met their demise. But the details, mm -hmm. I'm it, not sure. This is It's kind of ripe for a good documentary. But I think there's just not enough information like um w we talked about the uh the disappearance of kenley matheson and we watched like a six hour documentary series about his disappearance um and both of us criticized it for kind of dragging on too long and leaning on unnecessary details i think if you were going to do something about the pickering lost boys you'd run into the same problem there's just probably not enough to go through um they could easily make that 90 minutes, though. Easy. Yeah, it, it would yeah, be. A, it, it doesn't need to be six parts. It, it could be a 90 minute documentary if families and family and friends were willing to be involved and it'd talk about more about the boys and who they are and what their life was like, um, because the, there's just not enough to the story as far as details. It, it's just because it's all just you just have these little moments. They left the party. They were seen going into the marina stealing liquor they picked up someone on the way one of the boys was wasn't at the party came with them along the way boats were reported missing that's it that's it what if they got into a car along the way like we don't know it, exactly yeah there's a there's a million if well, only at least 10 10 to 50 even if they had video of them getting on a boat starting it and driving out you'd be like okay they're clearly in the water because it like this could end up it's not impossible that this could end up being solved and have nothing to do with the water because there is no could uh, you imagine yeah there's no solid proof putting them on the water it, so, it's it's yeah. circumstantial but it is a pretty big coincidence that they were there and a boat went missing but yeah it's it's not a, it's not a given what well, that'd be shocking oh, um now that now i hope that something like that does is found like kilometers away on land could you imagine well as long as if there's an answer out there it just i would just hope it gets back to the right people whatever it is sure. but um we'll see well we'll we'll start wrapping this up before we do we always end with you telling us what you're working on next uh you put up the video of you fighting with your cats to record something is that what you're working on what is it um no, that's that was this week's project, me fighting with the tiny dictators. Um, but for next week, I just recently found out someone on TikTok told me about the Lake Anjakuni village, which is a village in Nunavut, the Northwest Territories. And in 1930, this this village of like 25 to 30 people just kind of vanished. Oh, you told me about that. Yes. Yeah. So I'm unsure of how I want to present this because this is also another story with not a ton of information and because it's 93 years old even the original storytelling is like a little bit dicey and facts are hard to hard to know so i'm yeah i'm not sure how i want to present it yet but i i definitely want to talk about it i had never heard of that story until you sent me the article so i look forward to seeing what you do with it um but yeah it's not easy to dig up something that happened you know even if you're covering something pre-internet it's a whole yeah. different beast. Fortunately for me, I talk about this on my show a lot because I'm so grateful to have it. But in Nova Scotia, there is something called the Public Archives, which is funded by the provincial government, which is basically a building near Dalhousie University that is just a massive collection of newspapers and public records like death and marriage records going back like an eternity. So if, if I'm ever covering something, I can, I don't know, let's say in 1975, someone saw a UFO. I can go to the public archives without paying any money just as a citizen and start f 
going through these dusty old cabinets, getting all the newspapers from different parts of Nova Scotia from that day, the day before, the day after, and scrolling through them all. It's not the physical papers that like everything's scanned on like these little like microfilm cassette sort of things, but it's really and cool. Yeah. Is it like a big machine and you like turn it? Exactly. Like, the next slide. Yeah. That's so cool. I've only seen those in the movies. Oh yeah, they exist. And it's, um, it's I'm so jealous. very cool for research. Uh, w one of the things that was my favorite experience there is, um, I don't know if I ever told you this story, but I'm like obsessed with stories that take place in, in or around or involve Tim Hortons in some way. And when I was in high school in Cape Breton, uh, we had this thing that happened where someone thought they saw the face of the Virgin Mary on the brick wall of the Tim Hortons in Cape Breton, near where I'm from. And uh, they thought they saw it. So they told a few friends who also thought they saw the Virgin Mary's face on the bricks, who told a few more friends. And very quickly, it went from like, you know, uh, 50 people in the parking lot at Tim Hortons looking at this to, you know, busloads of people from across the country coming to Cape Breton. And it was, I have video of it. That's so nuts. It looks like Woodstock. There's just like, as far as the eye can see, people in cars, they're walking up, touching the bricks and crying and holding babies up to the bricks where the, you can kind of see, it's like there's a light kind of shining down on the bricks and it sort of has the look of a face. Um, but anyway, I was doing an episode about Jesus Christ's, uh, or I was saying the Virgin Mary, sorry. They thought it was Jesus himself, Jesus Christ's face. Um, I did an episode called like Jesus Christ's appearance at Tim Hortons or something. And so I went through, I went to the archives and I got all the papers from across Nova Scotia and even further across Canada to get like a sense of how the media was reporting on this crazy, crazy thing. And it, it was really cool to find, to find that and see it. Cause I experienced it firsthand as a kid. Like I, and, and when did you say late nineties this was? Yeah, I was in high school. It would have been like 95, 94. Oh my God. And it was a time they almost like, it was so bad. They almost had to close the highway the main highway entering Cape Breton because the, that that's where the Tim Hortons was. It was on, it was kind of off to the side from the highway. Um, like you'd have to take a turn off off the highway sort of thing to get to where this Tim Hortons was. But um, so many people were there and they were parking along the highway that it was just a matter of time before someone got smoked. Um, but what they ended up doing was the Tim Hortons was so concerned about being sued for someone like getting killed or hurt on their property with these crowds. They ended up, uh, trying to solve the problem they removed all the lights on the outside of the building and put a different style of lighting and the face was gone <laughs> and jesus left <laughs> yeah that's that's basically what happened um oh my god but yeah i have a video of i have a few videos that i got from different people who were there at the time with their like you know the big vhs i was just gonna quarter. say you had a camcorder <laughs> oh it wasn't my video just other people who were oh, okay. who were there that saw it uh, or that filmed it at the time but anyway that's just an example of uh the benefit of having access to something like that and you know I'm, uh, maybe if you went to none of it or, or the, wherever that you said that story had taken place there'd be something similar where somebody could find the original reporting but i have a feeling you're not funded to be able to jump on a plane and go out there and figure that out yourself unfortunately not i would go to the northwest territories in a second uh my friend went there once and it was beautiful and my dad's been there um but no, I, I can't jump on a plane tomorrow and go just to see if they have public archives. Neither can I. And because of that, I will watch your video and uh, get taken there by your storytelling. Uh, Madeleine, I'm always happy to have you here and happy to discuss these cases with you. So thanks for joining me tonight. Thank you for having me. And for anyone in the chat, if you haven't seen uh, Madeleine fighting with her cats, uh, you should check. I don't think you have it on YouTube. You should hop on her TikTok. Oh, I I'll, I'll add it to my YouTube, but it's it's posted on my TikTok and my Instagram right now. Okay, add it to your YouTube as well. Okay. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thomas, see you in the chat. Good job uh, trying to help Maddie understand square miles. Think of it this way, Maddie, is uh, Toronto is 243 <gasps> square miles. So... Lake Ontario could fit 30 Torontos. But this is, is that... this is this is the help I need. There you this go. This is the kind of information that this and, is perfect. Thank you, Thomas. And Lake, on, Lake Ontario is the 13th largest lake in the world. Interesting.
Wow. Yeah. All right. Well, Kristen, thanks for joining us. Uh, Thomas, thanks for helping Maddie. Uh, Mary Armstrong from Virginia, thanks for joining us. Ugly and Ryan, back up at the chat a little bit. Great to see you. Uh, Terrence, the hypno nipple, swears that Denver has the best sushi pizza. Denver sushi pizza is the best. I made that up. <laughs> he says, sorry. <laughs> he says, Denver sushi pizza is the best. I made that up, but I Googled and apparently there is a Canadian sushi pizza. <laughs> well, I want to talk more about the pizza I had in New Brunswick this summer. It had cream cheese in its crust. Really? And I was like, this is this is the most amazing thing I've ever had in my life. Uh, I could and, see that being yeah, good. Uh, it was when, amazing. Just before we go, for the I'll, I'll tell you this offline, but for the benefit of the listeners, uh, this pizza that I make a lot that I think is um, not a lot of people know about it. I don't know where I first had it, but I just call it pierogi pizza. And it's... Um, what you do is instead of pepperoni, you take a potato and you slice it into really thin slices. Um, instead of spaghetti sauce, you put sour cream. So anyway, you take dough, you put sour cream on it. Then you put the thin slices of potato, kind of like you would, like about as thick as pepperoni or whatever. Then you put cheddar cheese and crushed red peppers, like red, uh, you know, dried red pepper flakes or whatever, and bake it like that. And then when you're ready to eat it, when it's cooked, you put another big glob of sour cream in the center of the pizza. So everyone dips the slice in the sour cream and eat it. And it, I'm telling you, it's amazing. I've had pierogi pizza, but never like that. Okay. Well, we, I make it a lot. I'll, we, I do homemade pizzas is like one of my favorite things to make. And I'll usually make a couple. So I'll do like a pierogi pizza, a just cheese for my kids who don't eat anything that isn't beige and then pepperoni and cheese for me. Well, put cream cheese in the crust next time. Cream. I don't. I don't really eat cream cheese. I think cream oh, cheese is start. just cream cheese is just something that people ruin bagels with. Oh, I love cream cheese. Oh my god, it might be one of my favorite kinds of cheese. Uh, I use it for um, like in th like if I was making like a dip or something for nachos or something maybe. But I, I'll, I'll try it and I'll report back. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Kristen's yelling about sour cream in the chat. Sour cream is life. Uh, that's my motto, too. All right. I, I'd have to agree. Thanks for holding down the four with that, swinging that wrench around, Kristen. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs> uh, I'll be back Sunday night. Um, Sunday night at 9.15. Instead of uh, with Paul Polango at 9.15, me and Aaron will be doing Keep Canada Weird at 9.15. If you've seen last week's episode... It was a roller coaster of emotion, but Aaron agreed to come back again for another episode. So for goodness sakes, no one make any memes about him. He's fragile right now. Uh, 9.15 on Sundays, keep Canada weird. Because it's Super Bowl, Paul couldn't do his thing then, our thing then. So Paul and I will be 9.15 on Monday. And it's a big one because there's a lot of new news about Lisa Banfield that came out over the last few days. So Paul and I will discuss it and... Uh, legal expert and analyst Adam Rogers will be joining us. So thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.